is God's plan for our future? Join us as Pastor Sean Morton takes us on a six-part journey to explore why you should care. Future Forward. Future Forward. Our time is yet to come. Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing really well today. It's, uh, we're in an, an empty building right now, and so I'm... Uh, it's a little unnerving. I'm not going to, you know, we, you're used to as a communicator having people that are responding. And so um, I'm asking you today from your computer screen at home, from the radio that uh, you're amening me and cheering me on there. I believe that. And I know because that there are a bunch of you there because I want to just shout out to, well, we've got a lot of people online today. Andy and Eva, thanks for joining us. Um, Marlene, thanks for being here. Aaron, Deborah, Catherine, Peter from Saskatchewan. We're so glad you joined us here today and uh, happy that you're here with us. Kathy, Anne, Pauline, and, and Dale Hand, glad you're with us. Benita, so happy you're here. Dave, so great you're here. Thanks so much for joining us today. You know, um, you know, when the family of God comes together and when we study God's word, we are all made better because of that. And that's why we join together our hearts in church. There's this aspect of Christianity that is communal, meaning that it, it, it's fleshed out, it's, it's uh, lived out within the context of our relationships. That it's not just a one-to-one -one secret relationship, but it, 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 it's about coming together. And part of, you know, the technology today is allowing us to do that. I'm just so grateful you're here. Well, I want to talk today about, or introduce you to somebody before we get started here by the name of Bernie Madoff. You might recall that name, but you might not know the context of where you remember it, because he was a very big story in our lives. He was born in 1938. He was a plumber. But he became this renowned money manager and started his own firm by the age of 22. He had rapid success at the beginning. But his greed got the better of him. He is credited as being as being the mastermind behind the biggest investment fraud in all of history. He created the biggest and most notorious Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme. So what a Ponzi scheme is or a pyramid scheme, and this is the real basic part of it, is that you would go to a person, ask them to invest in your company or your product, the very first person, and you would say that, you know, based on your investment, you're going to get this rate of return back. His promises, in, in fact, were quite generous, but were within the threshold that was believable. So he asked the first person to invest. And then he went about asking a bunch of more people to invest. And in order to return, give this person the returns needed to uh, fulfill his promise, he began to use the funds from the other people underneath to, f to fund that return. And then it went down there and it went in layers, like just like a pyramid, as far as being able to use the people below's money in order to return the investment payment up above. What happened was, and how it all started to dissolve and fall apart, was back in 2008, if you remember, the financial crisis, and people started to cash in on their initial investments. The money dried up. By the time Bernie Madoff was tried, it is estimated that he ripped people off in excess of $65 billion. I want you to let that settle in a little bit because that is a lot of money. And the victim fallout from the deception and the greed of this was this, and this is a quote, many victims could no longer live independently, meet healthcare needs for themselves or a spouse, 
care for children or grandchildren, or otherwise provide for basic needs. Many victims were not wealthy. And for many, the loss of it all or a significant portion of their life savings had a brutal impact. Two of his victims, in fact, were very well-known celebrities such as Steven Spielberg and Kevin Bacon. You know, in fact, there were three suicides that were directly related to the amount of fraud that took place, including Bernie Madoff's own son. I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about Bernie Madoff, just to set a bit of a context for what we're going to be going back in history, looking into the Bible about, because there is a direct contemporary example there that happens in the story that we're going to be looking at. Now, if you remember, we're back in Joshua, and I just really, a quick recap of last week. You know, there's this battle ahead that Joshua takes, that's going to take place. Now, now if you remember that the battle was this battle of Jericho. And they were gonna have to f- fight this battle. And, and as they were about to go into battle, this angel shows up in front of them and reminds them or, and asks them, or Joshua even asks the angel and says, are you with us or are you against us? And it was a reminder that we have a free will to follow God's path or our own path. Because if you remember, the angel said that I'm on God's side. And so that was a reminder that we have free will and that God chooses his side, not necessarily our side or another side, but he chooses his side. And then if you remember, their battle strategy that was involved in fighting this battle was really God creating the plan. And that the strategy was to worship God first. And that was done physically, if you remember, because he had God's children, the army, start surrounding the city with the Levites. The Levites are those people that are commanded to just worship, or to worship God and lead God's children in the worship of God. And so they were the focal point. And reminded as they were worshiping as they were going around the city, we were reminded in the Psalms of what that looks like when we're worshiping God. And we have all those action words in the Psalms like singing to God, singing to him a new song, and clapping our hands, shouting. You know, all of the, you know, playing with our, playing with instruments. A lot of these action words that aren't just, you know, uh, timid, but gregarious in their presentation of how we worship God. And if you recall that worship isn't just that part of it, right? Worship is also how do we live our lives day to day from Monday to Saturday, not just on Sunday morning as a Christian. Worship means aligning ourselves with the things that matter to God most and what mattered to most to Jesus most. And that's how we worship God as well with our life, with our lifestyle. So Jesus, he is the best way for you to live out your life, to approach battles and to surrender to him. So where are we at now in this story that we've been looking through? And if you want to turn to Joshua chapter 6, that's where we're going to be right now, Joshua chapter 6. You can find that in your Bible. But where we are right now in the story is here that they, that God's... Uh, on, because of God, the Israelites were able to defeat Jericho. The city walls have come down. And they're just about to go into the city as a celebration and move on to the next place. But here's what God says, because this is very important from winning this battle. So God did the work. He's the one that brought the walls down. And he says this, I mean, he gives them a warning as they are about to continue to move forward. He says this, and what they might be tempted to do as a result of the wall coming down. And and God says this right to Joshua. Joshua 6, 18, but keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. So it's interesting in this passage because he's saying, you know, the walls have come down. Joshua, you can move forward, but do not take 
the devoted things that are in the city. Now, if you remember back what those devoted things were, you remember how we talked about this conquest language that's in the Bible in the Old Testament, and it's hard for us in a contemporary society to understand some of how that conquest language works and those expectations, at times, making God seem cruel. And here would be another time where it seems a little bit uh, cruel in a way. Because here they are, they're moving forward into the city, the city has crumbled, the, the city inhabitants have scattered, and there's these precious goods that are in the building. And part of conquest culture would be to take those goods and utilize them in your own culture. But God here is saying, stay away from the devoted things or else you're gonna bring destruction on yourself. Now remember, like I said, back when we were talking about this before, the Canaanite religion, it was the antithesis of God. In fact, it was so bad at, at points there with their belief structure that they were sacrificing children in order to gain benefit in their lives. Sacrificing to false gods. Like friends, that is evil. And so these devoted things that God was talking about, these are the things that they created to worship these gods that they were sacrificing children to. And God was saying, I do not want that in anywhere near you as God's children. I don't want those positions. I don't want anything to remind you, remind us of how horrifically people were, children were treated. And so that was what God was asking of God, of God's people at that point, at this point, sorry. Now, interestingly enough, he also says in that same passage of 6.18, he says that keep away from the devoted things, right? Otherwise, you will not bring about your own destruction, but you will also bring about destruction upon all of God's children if you were to do this. So this is what he warns them not to do. Here's what happened. And I want to remind you of this. This is, we don't, in, our, in this part of the story, we know what just is about to happen here in this place, right? Not anybody else. We are all, the only ones that are, have this knowledge. So it says in Joshua 7, 1, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Ekon, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Friends, like this wasn't a pack of gum that he stole. This was this object that was so despicable to God that he warned ahead of everybody, do not touch this stuff. And so Akan goes and takes one of these objects. See, they got off the road, they got off the road of God's victory plan for their lives because here's this moment where they actually do something at the very opposite of what God wants them to do. They wanted to do it their own way. And so this idea of Akon taking this object, doing it their own way, being that I want this object so I can increase my own wealth personally. I want to take this so that it's going to help me. This greed took over in Akan's life, like to the extent of treason. This greed that this one man did affected this entire nation. And sometimes when I was thinking about how that makes sense, where it's like, God, is that, that seems really unfair that you would say one person takes this devoted stuff and now you've just condemned the whole nation. But I didn't quite see it like that when I was reading this. It reminded me a little bit of a lot of those movies that we watch on TV, you know, where there's those treason, treasonous acts that, that some person takes, like the, that idea that there's this the treacher, treacherous treasurer of a nation and, and behind, or a politician, and he's making a deal with another nation behind the scenes so that they can uh, get wealth from it. And as a result of doing that, people are killed, right? That's how I was sort of looking at this story. It's this treasonous act that affects everybody. It, you know, it's almost like that guy that, you know, kind of has the new, you know, the same with those spy movies that we have, right? It's almost like that guy that has like the nuclear codes 
He's a one person, and you know, he presses the button, and the, the, the nuke goes over, and then the other nation retaliates and blows up the other whole nation. It's sort of the same principle, right? This treasonous act that affected everybody as a result of one act. So what happens? What happens when Achan does this? He does this secretive thing, keeps these devoted things against God. What happens in the rest of the story? Joshua and, and, the, and God's children in the armies go into the next battle that they have to face as they're walking through God's journey. But Joshua and the army get defeated. It says here in Joshua 7, 4, just as you're, as you're tracking along, they chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. So remember when I went we back there, we were examining this scripture and we saw that, you know what, we have, we have knowledge here that nobody else has. We knew that Achan had stolen some stuff that was devoted to other false gods that God hated, warned everybody, do not do this. He did it anyway. So we know this at this point. Joshua and the rest of God's children do not know this. They go into battle and they are defeated. Joshua comes back from this battle, and, and this is immediately what happens in Joshua 7, 6, and 8. And he says this, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring his people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan in the desert. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? So the people, they're, they're going forward and, and uh, they get fought back and people were killed in this next skirmish and Joshua of course at this point he said what just happened now remember up to this point friends the whole story has been how does Joshua and God's people how do we align with God's path in life and remember the first thing we talked about was that that God made promises to Moses to Joshua that transcended the promises of just those people to all of God's children so we remember there, there's promises that took place there was all along this, this journey, there was these encouragements to, you know, be strong. I'm gonna you know, put your anointing on your, this anointing from God on your life to go to the next point, right? So we've got that, we've got that point where we're walking on this path, we come across this river and, and Jesus, and God is saying at this point, it's like, give that most devoted thing up to, to, to me. Right? They took the Ark of the Covenant, went to the riverside, the waters parted, they were able to walk through. God went first, if you remember that part. So this whole journey has been going really smoothly and they've been doing everything that God wants them to do. And here they are going into battle, it falls apart. And of course, the first response from Joshua is like, what on earth just took place? And if this is the way it's gonna be, I wish we would have stayed back where we were. And I think we all have that in our times and our minds, right? Where we're walking along God's journey and we don't understand what just happened. God, we believe these promises that you gave for us, that you're gonna help guide us, you're gonna give us strength to move forward. We've, if you remember in the past when we talked about the sermons, we've never had any expectation that there isn't gonna be troubles along the path. And so here they are, they're find, they're finding, they've got these troubles now and they don't understand what just took place. They can't figure it out. We have those same feelings that Joshua had as well. You see, what I think is happening here with Joshua is he doesn't understand why the formula isn't working. I mean, isn't that so much like you and me at times, right? We don't understand the formula. We can't, as we're walking, we're trying our best to follow God's path. And sometimes something happens and we just can't figure out what happens. You know, and I find this next part really interesting because I think this is so indicative of our own lives. As we get into these, 
uh, along these journeys in life where we hit these paths at times, it's, it's easy to lose faith, right? The things that we believed in when we were following God's path, and as long as it was working out great, well, then it's easy to have faith. But at times when it's not working out great, when there's a, something happens where the, the battle that you're fighting, you lose, it's so easy to lose faith in the promises that God has for your life and for my life. And the comfort I take from this is this, that you know, in, this, in these verses here that he's going on, you know, I take comfort in the fact that in this moment when you're losing faith, Joshua himself has this conversation, a very raw conversation with God. And it reminds me that I think, friends, it's okay to vent when things aren't going right to God. You know, I'm reminded in the scripture how he knows he's counted the hairs on our head. Even before we were born, he's knitted us in the womb. There's this sense that God knows everything about us. And so, you know, he even knows what we are thinking, what we are feeling. And so this passage sort of reminds me that Joshua here in this dark moment vents to God just saying, I'm losing faith here. We should have just stayed back and not bothered going on this journey at all. But it gives me hope because I think it's a pattern for all of us that when we're running through, when we're in tough times in our lives, when we hit this obstacle or this this battle that, that bites back, that we have the comfort to know that we can go to God with those feelings. And I think in doing that, it opens up, it keeps the conversation going between yourself and God when those moments happen. So instead of closing down, not reacting to those moments, stewing, fuming about why this isn't working out or what's happening on my journey right now, but expressing those things to God, I think it opens up the fact that there is now still able to have a conversation because that's what happens with God and with Joshua. The conversation continues, even in the midst of him having this emotional outbreak. And it says this in Joshua 7, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Here is what Joshua finds out in this emotional outburst that takes place. He finds out that it was because of a con that the battle wasn't won. It was because of Akan's greed and his disobedience that diverted them from God's path to their future and their success. Friends, this is what I want you to consider. Sometimes, we can end up destroying our own future. The best future that you want for your life, the best future that God wants for your life by holding on to sin, by going our own way and ignoring what Jesus wants. And this path to the future that God is laying out for us, this path that we see in Joshua as a pattern for our own paths That path can't contain significant vices in your life. Or that desire of, well, I I want what I want, when I want, whenever I want, to whomever I want, however I want. Especially when that desire, when those vices go against God's ultimate plan for what he has for your life and your future. And that story that we just talked about in Joshua there, it reminds me that those decisions that we make as we're walking down that path, sometimes they don't always affect only ourselves, but they affect those around us as well. Sometimes even the ones that we love the most. You know, 
when we, uh, we start our life journey, our souls at time, I think they look a bit like this, this clear glass of water. And this, our souls, they started at conception. You know, this idea of eternal life that we think about in the Bible, it doesn't just happen when you die and then boom, you're in eternal life. But eternal life starts the moment you are conceived. It doesn't start when you die. Like there's a switch that takes place. God himself tells us in the Bible that, that, that before we were even born, He knew us in the womb. So this eternal life, this pure state, and God's eternal plan, his eternal perspective for us, looks like a clear container of water. And at times we go through life and we make decisions that move away us from this state, this state that God wants for us. And sometimes, you know, those small decisions that we have, They sometimes that, that get us away from this clear state, the state that God wants us ultimately to be in. Sometimes the small decisions at times start to cloud the state. And we may look at this water right now if you're watching online and you go, oh, that's not a big deal. I can manage something like that. But sometimes those things that we add to our lives start really making it a little darker. You know, I'm thinking about some of those big things in life. There, you know, there's back, back, in the, uh, back in the 400s, I believe it was, there was this, you know, uh, religious philosopher that came up with the seven deadly sins. I, I think sometimes those seven deadly sins that we know about, we've seen them in movies at times, I think they really encompass a lot of little things as well underneath Instead of have this laundry list of I did this bad, I did this bad, I did this bad, I did this bad. You know, sometimes I think of it as far as the seven deadly sins, just say, you know what, I've got to work on these upper level things because they affect so many other things. But sometimes we have greed in our lives. You know, and sometimes we have lust. And sometimes it's wrath. And sometimes it's envy. Sometimes it's gluttony, pride, sloth. And what was, what was initial, initially and what was um, meant to be clear in your journey in life, it's gotten clouded. It would be something that none of us would want to drink at this point. It clouds up our lives. And, and maybe you're thinking right now as you're watching this and you're watching me, you're like, well, no big deal. It's just me. You only live once. And I understand that sentiment. That's a sentiment that a lot of us have at times. I want to do it my way, just like we talked about last week. But the thing about that story we just talked about in Joshua, where this person sinned, sometimes that sin that we have in our own lives, the consequences of that, this is kind of like friends and family. Sometimes that sin that's in our own lives here that we've darkened our hearts with, it starts spilling out into everybody around us. And the consequences of our own sin start bleeding in, into other people's lives, right? It's sort of like that Bernie Madoff story that we just initially talked about. When we make decisions contrary to God's path for us in life, what we would call sin, when we, start, we decide to drive into the ditch instead of walking the wa- road that God wants us to walk on, when we do those sort of things, it dramatically can affect those around us, right? Because of Bernie Madoff's greed, people's retirements were destroyed. Because of Bernie Madoff's greed, his lying, his deceit, he spent the rest of his life in prison, alienating his entire family. After being caught, he was convicted and he died in prison. No way of accessing the wealth that he had, had, his greed actually generated. And as I said before, his own son ended up taking his life as a result of that. You see, sometimes I think we all, all of us, at times, 
We have this expectation that that God always moves us forward on this path to a better tomorrow. Well, uh, God, I I signed up to be a Christian, right? So you're always going to move me forward on this path. Even when we veer into the ditch, when we're holding on to to things in our lives that God wants us to get rid of, right? Those sin things. When we, even when we're holding on to this and we're driving in the ditch, we sometimes, I think, go through life saying, God, well, I'm going to hold on to this here really tight. And as I'm going to walk down your path, and immediately this thing drives you into the ditch, but you're going, well, God, but I'm in the ditch right now. And uh, but you know what? I, I, I accepted Jesus way, way, way back. And, and I know everything I do is going to be blessed by you. And I get it. I want that freedom at times as well to do whatever it is I want to do whenever I want. But some, I don't think we can expect that our selfish de- desires are going to always be blessed by God. Because some of those selfish things aren't the best things for you in your life and not are contrary to what God wants for you ultimately in your life. The path is always there to follow. And God is always intervening in our lives to push us back onto that path, even when we are in the ditch. That path for a better future, that path to a better life. But friends, we do need to reset the wheel at times. We have to clear up those muddy waters that that we were just looking at. Those muddy waters that get like that, our soul that gets like that because of this following our own path, following, allowing sin to be part of our lives in a way that God doesn't want us to have that. One way to get on track again, one way to clear up those waters, and this is the good news, is that we go back to the source in order to do that. The source that was perfect, the one that doesn't have a stained glass or is off the track, but is in the middle of the road. And that, friends, is, that's the good news about Jesus, and that's the good news about this story from the Old Testament. You see, it was consistent throughout the entire Bible that God was always wanting us to get back on his track for our lives. You see, what happens in that story where, where Joshua, where they find out that this was wrong, that what, what, what happened there wasn't what God's plan was for the lives? What happens, what happens is, after they repent, after they say they're sorry, after they regret what they did, they, and turned around and chose to follow God's direction, they got the victory. And God goes even further to remind us, it's in Joshua 8, 1, and he says this, after they've repented and after they've moved forward, they've got the victory, God says to them, Joshua 8, 1, he says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Do you remember we talked about that a few weeks ago where that was a promise from God? Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Because God's going with you. And so after this act that the Joshua and the Israelites did of, of repenting and turning and trying to follow God's path again, God's confirming for him that he is still walking with them. He also gave them the victory over the next obstacle as they continued to realign themselves with what God wanted for their lives, what God wants for your life. And that's the great thing about this story, about the Bible itself, is that when we trip up, when we get off of the path that God has for us by putting those things, sin things in our lives that, that, G, that God, Jesus, doesn't want for our lives, when we, when we do that, The good news is, is that even when we trip up, God wants to realign us back. Even when we make a mistake like that, he wants us to drive out of the ditch, to take that steering wheel, get it back on track. And how do we do that, friends? Well, it's through Jesus, right? By saying, Jesus, I am sorry that I've gotten off track here. I've allowed things that have have poured into my life that I'm not proud of. I know you're not proud of. It says it in the Bible that there's things in my life right now that I I shouldn't be holding on to. And the good news is that as we repent, as we let Jesus take the wheel, as we let Jesus clean up that dark sin that has stained our souls, 
He wants us to continue to bless us moving forward on our track. Now, friends, I want a side note here for you listening. Maybe you've been in church for a long time, and I, I've just, I'm going off the notes a little bit here because I believe Jesus just told this, the Holy Spirit just told me this, is that, is that sometimes when we're walking down life's road and bad things happen to us in lives, it, it's not sin necessarily in our own lives that causes that. You remember there's this passage in Matthew where, um, where the Pharisees were asking, well, here's this blind guy, you know, what did he do or what are, did his parents do? And Jesus says that nobody did anything. It's because sin is just generally in the world at times. So I want you to make sure that from this message, you're not like, well, my life is on track right now and, and it must be because I did something really wrong or bad. That's not always the case, friends. But the thing that we can do as we reflect back on our own lives and the areas that, that you're going, yeah, I need to address this part of my life. I do want to be on God's plan for my life. I don't want my soul to be looking like this, right? I want it to be clean and clear. And so the way to do that, friends, by surrendering to Jesus and just repenting. And like I said, the, the idea of repenting is to turn away, to turn into a new direction. And so I want to ask you to consider that today as we're wrapping up. Because it says this in 1 John, and I want to leave you this. If we claim that we are free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, simply come clean and ab about them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. So friends, get your, get your soul cleaned up. Get yourself back on God's path for your life. Tripping up doesn't mean doom. And repentance doesn't mean weakness. Let's just take a minute to pray. Jesus, please forgive me for getting off the path you have for me in my life. I admit there's lots that tempt me, and as I walk through life, I've even indulged in those things. But I know that you want what's best for me. You want me to walk in the eternal life that I was born into, the eternal life that leads me straight to you and the promised land. Forgive me for choosing pride. Help me to choose envy. Forgive me, help me to choose humility. Forgive me for choosing envy. Help me to choose kindness. For, for, forgive me for choosing gluttony. Help me to choose discipline. Forgive me for choosing lust. Help me to choose virtue. Forgive me for choosing greed. Help me to choose generosity. Forgive me for choosing sloth. Help me to choose diligence. Forgive me for choosing wrath. Help me to choose patience. Amen. One last thing, friends. You know, we talked about some of these things that, you know, well, I don't know what it is that God wants me to do with my life and, and how do I get on this road and, and what, how do I align with those things? And, and the way we do that, friends, is through the Bible. We read the Bible. I want to encourage you with one quick practical thing today as we've reflected on this scripture, how I think we've come to the conclusion that we all have at times let sin into our lives and let it stay. And we've gotten off God's path. We want him to forgive us of that, help us to realign us. Some of those things that we, we haven't considered before that, that maybe our sin or, or things that, that are contrary to what God's path is, you know, the only way we do that is through reading the word. I want to encourage you in this today. What's the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning right now? You probably grab your phone. So I want to encourage you in this. Today, I want you to find a Bible. If you've got one at home, if you don't have a Bible, you reach out to this church, we'll get you a Bible. But I want you to take a Bible. I want you to open it. Leave it literally open on your side table or the most clear place in your house. Leave it open. I want you to start 
at a place called John. You can find it easily. It's about right in the middle of the book. So find that John, and I want you to leave it open. Now, reason why I want you to leave it open, it's pretty hard to ignore an open book at times, right? Kind of closed, put away somewhere, pretty easy to forget about. But I want you today, tomorrow, I want you to put that Bible out, put it in John or wherever you are reading, leave it open so that the first thing you do when you get up is look to that word that you might align yourself, what the priorities are of Jesus and God for our lives.